Welcome to this introduction to the GI map. I'm going to walk you through the GI map, including all of the markers in the test. And we're also going to be covering a little bit about the methodology that sets GI map apart. Lastly, I'm going to walk you through the resources that are available to you to help you with understanding GI map so that you can connect the dots best for your patients. GI map actually stands for gastrointestinal microbial assay plus. GI map includes a number of different markers to give you insights into both the microbial ecosystem as well as the related gastrointestinal physiology. And note that both of those systems influence one another. And that's a key part of helping clinicians connect the dots for their patients. GI map includes a number of different markers to help clinicians gain a comprehensive set of insights into gastrointestinal function. And those include pathogens and opportunists, normal microbes, markers for digestive function, markers reflecting immune responses, markers related to intestinal barrier integrity, as well as markers that give insights into gastrointestinal detoxification, the presence of occult blood, and also the presence of antibiotic resistance genes, specifically in Helicobacter pylori. When practitioners are considering options for comprehensive gastrointestinal testing, it's important to understand what sets GI map apart. And this essentially boils down to three main categories, the first of which is the unique set of markers that comprise GI map. These were specifically selected for their clinical relevance in helping to provide clinicians with key clinical insights for better patient outcomes. Next, we have the unique methodology that is employed uh, for the GI map test. And this methodology features quantitative PCR for detection and quantitation of the microbes. And this provides superior sensitivity as well as accuracy and also includes absolute quantitation so that we know exactly how much of a given microbe is present per gram of stool sample. Lastly, and perhaps most importantly, we provide a wealth of resources for clinicians as well as extensive support for practitioners who are just beginning to learn GI map and then who can progress on to a more expert level of understanding GI map. And this includes a, a variety of different resources, which we will also touch upon later in the video. So this unique set of characteristics, the markers, the unique methods, as well as the extensive set of educational materials combined together to provide clinicians with very relevant deep insights into how GI map applies to different patient scenarios. So it's really all about connecting the dots. In terms of clinical insights, GI map provides practitioners with important clinical insights into common GI scenarios, such as general gastrointestinal symptoms, such as bloating, gas and discomfort, pathogenic infections involving bacteria, viruses, fungi, and also parasites, insights into the very common condition of irritable bowel syndrome, as well as food sensitivities and food intolerances, insights into small intestinal dysbiosis, including SIBO, inflammatory bowel disease, autoimmune conditions, and also extra intestinal conditions, such as conditions involving the skin, joints, hormone balance, as well as conditions involving the nervous system, such as mood disorders. Now I'd like to walk you through the GI map report itself and highlight the markers that are included on GI map. The GI map report includes five pages of results, including on page one, gastrointestinal pathogens, page two, the results for H. pylori, as well as the normal commensal bacteria, on page three are the opportunistic microbes ranging from bacteria to fungi to viruses. On page four, we have the parasitic opportunistic microbes, as well as the intestinal health markers. And then lastly, on page five are the H. pylori antibiotic resistance genes. So as you can see, the overall report for GI map is quite condensed, easy to read, only five pages, uh, very easy for clinicians, busy clinicians, to quickly scan and then identify the most relevant results for their patients. On page one are the bacterial, parasitic, and viral pathogens 
that are common causes of acute gastroenteritis. Note that in some cases, some of these pathogens may be present more chronically, such as Giardia, and may contribute in some cases to chronic symptoms. However, most commonly, pathogenic infections often tend to be asymptomatic. The rate will vary from pathogen to pathogen. A key example is Clostridium difficile, where the majority of detected cases appear to be asymptomatic, which is consistent with research literature that the majority of detected C. diff in stool samples represents asymptomatic cases. Also note that for C. diff, as well as additional pathogens, we are detecting toxin genes, which provides additional information on potential pathogenic strains that are present in the stool sample. It's important to note that a GMAP is based on DNA detection. So we're looking at the gene level, not the protein level. So we're not able to determine with DNA methods whether or not the genes are actually being actively expressed. So note that this represents a potential infection and as always, it's important to consider symptoms. Moving on to page two are the results for H. pylori. As you can see here, this particular patient's levels were detected, but not above the reference range. This means that H. pylori is present, but may be less likely to be symptomatic for that patient. Reference ranges are established to provide guidance for clinicians in terms of levels that may be more likely to be clinically significant. Also note that virulence factors for H. pylori are included. Virulence factors are genes that encode proteins that have various roles in the infection process. They're also considered risk factors for more significant pathogenic infections. In general, the more virulence factors that you see that are detected, the greater the significance of the infection may be. And that's indicating a potentially more pathogenic strain or a set of strains that may be detected. Below the results for H. pylori on page two are the commensal and keystone bacteria. These are representative members of the normal microbiome that can provide key insights into the overall health and function of the microbiome. This set of keystone species includes, in particular, Acromancia mucinifila, Picalibacterium prausnitsi, and Roseburia, which all have especially important roles in the microbial ecosystem, such as promoting mucus production, and also promoting the production of key short-chain fatty acids, such as butyrate. Also note the phyla that are listed here in this section on page two, which includes the Bacteroidetes and the Firmicutes phyla. This provides a high-level view of the microbiome based on the fact that these phyla are at the top of the taxonomic hierarchy. So this is a, a providing a broad-level view of the microbiome, in particular levels overall, of the two most important phyla. Note that when these phyla are uh, represented as high or low, that is indicating a significant imbalance in the microbiome. Moving on to page three, the top section includes opportunistic and overgrowth microbes that are commonly elevated in patients who are symptomatic and may have various conditions. These opportunistic microbes are broken down into four subcategories which will be discussed in the following slides. This first section includes dysbiotic and overgrowth bacteria. These are bacteria that are commonly elevated in conditions such as hypochlorhydria, pancreatic dysfunction, food sensitivities, food intolerances, irritable bowel syndrome, and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Note also at the bottom, there's another section titled commensal overgrowth microbes. These microbes tend to be overgrown under similar conditions, but note that these are called commensals because they are present in virtually every one. So they're really not necessarily considered out of balance until they're elevated. The next section of microbes is the inflammatory and autoimmune-related bacteria. These are bacteria that are associated with inflammation. They may contribute to inflammation, but also may thrive under inflammatory conditions. They've also been associated with a variety of inflammatory and autoimmune conditions as well. Note that the next section is titled Commensal Inflammatory and Autoimmune Related Bacteria. These are bacteria that are present commonly in most people, 
and often contributes to beneficial functions when they're present at normal levels, but when elevated, may also be associated with inflammation, and in some cases may contribute to inflammation. The next section of GI map includes relatively common fungi and yeast that may be found in the gastrointestinal tract and occasionally cause symptoms. Candida species in particular are commonly associated with symptoms such as bloating, abdominal discomfort, and food sensitivities. Some candida species, such as candida albicans, have been linked to certain autoimmune and inflammatory conditions, including rheumatoid arthritis and inflammatory bowel disease. Below the fungi and yeast section is a section that includes cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus. These viruses commonly infect certain tissues in the body, but are relatively rarely detected in the gastrointestinal tract. When these viruses are detected at high levels on GI map, they may be associated with gut inflammation and intestinal barrier dysfunction. On page 4 of GI map, you'll find a list of additional gastrointestinal parasites, including protozoa and worms. Protozoa are single-celled eukaryotic microbes that are commonly found in contaminated food and water sources. They are more likely to colonize the gut in patients with bacterial dysbiosis and digestive dysfunction. Infections with protozoa may result in symptoms such as abdominal discomfort and loose stools or diarrhea, but many patients can remain asymptomatic. In addition to protozoa, GI map includes a number of parasitic worms. Intestinal worms are relatively rare in industrialized countries, but when present, may result in gastrointestinal symptoms. Within the intestinal health markers section of GI map, you'll find a number of markers that reflect various aspects of gastrointestinal health and physiology, including digestive function, detoxification, the presence of occult blood, immune responses, inflammation, and leaky gut. Next, we'll walk through each of the markers in this section. The digestion section includes steatocrit, which is a marker indicating the presence of excess fat in the stool. Levels above 15% indicate likely fat malabsorption, which may be due to reduced bile acid production, pancreatic insufficiency, or small intestinal dysfunction. Pancreatic elastase is a marker for pancreatic enzyme production. Levels below 200 indicate reduced pancreatic enzyme production, which is a common contributing factor in patients with bloating, abdominal discomfort, loose stools, and occasionally constipation. Reduced pancreatic enzyme production is also a common contributor to overgrowth of various opportunistic microbes. Under GI markers, you'll find beta-glucuronidase, which is an enzyme that is produced by various opportunistic bacteria. When elevated, beta-glucuronidase can be a sign of significant dysbiosis. High beta-glucuronidase can also interfere with the elimination of various toxins and hormone metabolites by modifying them in a way that reduces their excretion and increases their reabsorption. This can contribute to hormone imbalances and increased toxin levels in the body. The occult blood marker FIT is a highly sensitive marker for the presence of blood in the stool. A range of conditions can increase the presence of blood in stool from temporary minor conditions to infections, inflammatory conditions, and even colon cancer. The markers included in the immune response section are helpful for gaining key insights into specific immune responses occurring in the gut. These markers include secretory IgA, which is the most abundant immunoglobulin produced by mucosal immune cells. Secretory IgA plays an important role in protecting the intestinal mucosa from pathogenic and opportunistic microbes, and it also binds to food antigens to help reduce excessive immune responses to harmless antigens. Antigliadin IgA is a marker for immune reactivity to gluten. When antigliadin IgA is elevated, it may be an indicator of gluten sensitivity. Eosinophil activation protein is a marker for activation of eosinophils, and excessive activation of eosinophils is involved in a variety of conditions, including food sensitivities, functional gastrointestinal disorders, eosinophilic esophagitis, and inflammatory bowel disease. GI map also includes the widely recognized inflammation marker, calprotectin. Calprotectin is produced primarily by neutrophils as part of the inflammation process. 
Calprotectin may be elevated temporarily during infections and exposure to other inflammatory triggers. It can also be elevated in chronic autoimmune and inflammatory disorders such as Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Sonulin is an optional marker that can be added to GMAP. As a well-known marker for leaky gut, sonulin can provide key insights into the health of the intestinal barrier, especially in conditions such as food sensitivities and autoimmune diseases. On the final page of the GMAP report is the antibiotic resistance panel for H. pylori. This panel shows the results for the detection of antibiotic resistance genes in the H. pylori genome to common types of antibiotics, including amoxicillin, clarithromycin, chloroquinolones, and tetracycline. This information could be helpful for selecting specific antibiotics for H. pylori treatment. The GIMAP Interpretive Guide and GIMAP White Paper, available in the Learning Resources section on the Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory website, are invaluable resources for learning more about the individual microbial and intestinal health markers on GIMAP. Additional resources, including an extensive library of educational resources, are also available to help practitioners get the most out of GIMAP. Now that we've briefly walked through the individual markers that are included on GIMAP, Let's focus briefly on the specific methodology that GIMAP is based on, which is one of the key factors that sets GIMAP apart. When it comes to methodology for detecting and quantitating microbes, qPCR offers several important advantages. In fact, researchers developed qPCR because other methods were not considered to be sufficiently accurate. The primary advantages of qPCR include the following. The first point is that the accuracy of qPCR is well established to be superior to other methods that are commonly used to detect microbes, and those include standard PCR, metagenomic sequencing, as well as culture. qPCR also provides high sensitivity as well as specificity and also provides absolute quantitation, and this is in comparison to the relative quantitation that characterizes sequencing methods. So this absolute quantitation enables accurate correlations with clinical data. qPCR is also superior for identifying and quantitating pathogens and opportunists, which are typically present at very low levels. So detecting and quantitating the clinically relevant pathogens and opportunists that are often present at very low levels among the dominant commensal microbes can be like trying to find the needles in the haystack which is something that qPCR is especially good at doing. Now that we've reviewed how the unique markers and methodology help to set GMAP apart, let's walk through the extensive educational and interpretive resources that are provided to help practitioners gain important, actionable clinical insights from GMAP. To help practitioners from those who are new to GMAP to those who are experienced in working with GMAP, Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory offers a wide range of educational and clinical support including an extensive library of videos and articles, classes, an e-newsletter, and social media content. We also offer free 30-minute consultations with a clinical education specialist to assist with interpreting GMAP results, as well as customer service professionals who are on hand to answer questions, schedule consultations, and assist with ordering tests. As noted previously, the interpretive guide and white paper are often a great place to start for practitioners who are new to GIMAP and want to learn more about the individual markers on the test. In addition to learning about the individual markers on GIMAP, we offer additional resources to help practitioners better understand the various patterns on GIMAP, including the three most common dysbiosis patterns. These include the insufficiency dysbiosis pattern, the inflammatory dysbiosis pattern, and the digestive dysfunction dysbiosis pattern, with the insufficiency pattern denoting lack of commensal and keystone bacteria, the inflammatory pattern reflecting an increase in inflammatory microbes, and the digestive dysfunction dysbiosis pattern in which various normal and opportunistic microbes are elevated, which typically reflects digestive issues such as hypochlorhydria, pancreatic insufficiency, and small intestinal dysfunction. Additional resources include functional groupings of various microbes on GIMAP to help practitioners recognize important groups of microbes 
such as those that produce various intestinal gases, such as hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide, and groups of microbes that can produce other important compounds, such as histamine and lipopolysaccharide, or LPS. Additional resources include helpful guides for recognizing GI map patterns that are associated with specific conditions, such as food sensitivities, IBS, and SIBO. The Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory YouTube channel includes a wide range of video content to help practitioners learn the basics of working with GI map. Additional videos focus on working with GI map in a variety of patient scenarios and clinical conditions, such as the video shown here on food sensitivities, mast cell activation, H. pylori infection, and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Our science-based education includes extensive references so practitioners can gain confidence in the accuracy of the content that's presented. Our educational content also includes up-to-date references so practitioners can gain important clinical insights from new research developments. That brings us to the end of this introduction. Thank you for listening, and I hope this helps you understand how GMAP can help you connect the dots for your patients for the best clinical outcomes.